Hello, welcome. Today I am speaking, or well, this evening, I am speaking to Nerissa, which I'm very excited about. We've been following each other on Instagram. It's the first time that we've spoken live. She is kindly going to be sharing her journey and she's mid-cycle. So we're going to talk about that and trying for a sibling. So let's say to those who are joining, we'll be talking about personal experiences. And if anyone has any questions from Nerissa as we talk, then please do join. Hello, how are you? Hi, love. How you doing, Miss Eloise, honey? <laughs> I'm good. I was just giving a brief introduction to you, but you can introduce yourself. And I was just saying that we followed each other for a while and it's so nice yes. to be actually talking. Um, so yes. please introduce yourself and we'll go from there. Hi, everybody. I'm Narissa. And as Eloise was saying before, I am mid-cycle, but... I should probably start from the beginning uh -huh. <laughs> of our entire journey. So my husband, Kenny, and I um, got married in 2016. And um, prior to that, we had always talked about we wanted to start a family. Um, Kenny would joke a lot and say, we're going to have like seven children. Like we, we used to talk about it all the time. And so we got married and we were thinking, you know, we're going to go on this honeymoon. And if we come back pregnant, wonderful. Because at the time... I was 31. I had just turned 31 and my husband had just turned 35. So we were ready to start a family, right? So we went on our honeymoon, nothing. So we were like, you know what? We're not going to think about it. We're going to travel. We're going to, you know, enjoy one another, as everybody says to do. Um, and so we traveled. We did all these things. And um, after basically two years of really, truly trying, um, and trying to relax, as people say, mm -hmm. um, we still weren't pregnant. So um, Kenny went and got checked. I went and got checked, and my hormones and everything were up to par. Everything looked good. Um, my OB was like, you know, just, you know, wait it out. We're going to check Kenny out. And we went and checked Kenny out and found out that our reasoning was male factored. Um, so from that point, the urologist basically sent us to the Women's Institute here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and from there, we just been, honey, <laughs> trying to get this family. Um, we started in January of 2018, um, saved our money um, and started our cycle because um, it was, as you know, extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so we started our cycle um, 2018. Really, I would say stems, all of that kind of stuff. It was May. Um, and so we started everything. And from our first cycle, we ended up with um, 16 eggs. And That's a we, lot. Okay. And I feel every bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, we had 16 eggs and then... Um, 11 of them fertilized and 11 of them made to blastuses. We sent them off for PGS testing and we had uh, four embryos. So we were like, okay, we have four chances to try. So the first two chances and tries failed. So our first two transfers were failures. Um, after the second transfer, um, my doctor was like, we're going to test you and make sure um, we're going to do an ERA, make sure we're doing this at the right time. And we're also going to um, see if there's any inflammation. We're going to do a biopsy. So we did a biopsy and my ERA came back normal. We did the biopsy, came back that I had endometritis. Can you just so, explain to people watching who don't know what an ERA is, what it is? Yeah, so an ERA is basically a test that monitors, I guess you can say, in a mock cycle, if your meds and everything are up to par. And also, if they are transferring your embryo at the correct time for your body. So okay. there's a time when there might be a time when they test you and it, they find out that they need to transfer your embryo a day earlier, or a day later, depending on what your body is doing at that time with the medication and where your levels are. Um, so that for us was, was normal, but I had chronic endometritis. So I was like, what is going on? Um, so she said, well, we'll do a couple weeks of medications 
and um, try and clear this. And at that point, I changed a lot of different things. So I started doing acupuncture. Um, I started eating totally different. I had like a dairy-free, gluten-free, um, just very high vegetable diet. So I was really focused on that. Um, I ate tons of greens, tons of berries, things that were good for my body. And through my acupuncturist, I found out that there's foods that do inflame you in general. So I cut all of that out. So I was like, no white potatoes, no, um, what other things are just, uh, crazy tomatoes or acidic, all those things I like literally cut out of my diet. Cause I was like, we're trying everything that we can. <laughs> so, hard, so hard, isn't it? All the things that oh, you enjoy. Goodness. Oh my goodness. So I was like, we're everything that I love the most I couldn't eat so I was like okay we're gonna try this I had acupuncture I was doing that once a week and I did my medication and we ended up doing another biopsy to make sure it was cleared and it was cleared do you think that's um, down to all of the stuff that you were doing yourself too I think so I think um it was a combination of yeah. a lot of things um I, I think that everybody's body is different right and so there's certain things that nourish us and there's certain things that cause us issues. So for me, it's inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing the right foods to put in your body, knowing the things that you have to do, may it be light exercise, whatever. Um, I always say, try everything you can in your power mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's the only thing that you have control over. Because honestly, when you start this type of thing, your control is no longer there for your body. It's your doctors and guys. And that's Absolutely. it. That's all you <laughs> You can do everything. So literally, we did everything we could. And we had our third FET, and we conceived our 17-month-old now, Kennedy. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. So it took work. It took time. I can tell you that the first two failed transfers. I say the first one, I was absolutely devastated. I cried for days um, because, you know, at that time you, you feel like it's going to work. Like you just have this in your mind that, okay, this is going to work. And then when it doesn't, it's like the first thing you question is you. What's wrong with me? How, what did I do wrong? You also plan your life, don't you, in your head around what if it's positive, like, but then yes. what if it's not? So the due date mm -hmm. would be X and then, you know, would it be yeah. a girl? Would it be a boy? All the things that, you know, you want to get excited about, but you're obviously so apprehensive. You um, are. And I think it's like you were saying, you plan these things in your life. You plan um, you want when you want to have children, all of those things. And I think... Um, especially going through this process because you want it so bad. We set our expectations so high because we want it. We set it so high. And so that's what I did. I set my expectations to the roof. Cause I was like, this is going to work. Cause we had been trying and I was like, you know, this is more um, a controlled situation. But in reality, when it doesn't work for you is when you start realizing like, you know what? I have to ride it out. And my husband told me after that first failure, like, you cannot, he's like, never get too high on the highs or low on the lows. Just ride it in the middle. Mm -hmm. And he's, and that's absolutely true because you don't want to set your expectations too low because God is able and you don't want to set them too high because you, you can easily, it, it, nothing is guaranteed and it's not within your control. So the best thing that you can do is sit back and like I say, just enjoy the ride because that's all you can do. And so what, what was it like finding out you were pregnant with your daughter? Were you really nervous the whole way through the pregnancy? Yes. Um, for us, I, like, even for me, I, like, you know how women take the pictures of their pregnancy and progression, like, from the beginning? I waited until I was literally 15, 16 weeks um, because I was terrified. I didn't know what to expect. And I think, um, as a lot of people, and I'm sure you heard, infertility PTSD is real. Mm -hmm. um you you can you enjoy the fact and you're happy that you're pregnant but you're always so apprehensive all the way to the end you know because you are just so just into the fact that okay one all these different times it's failed why now is it working i think it's like you just have this thing in your mind that just sets you off really um and it, it causes you to spiral like a lot of times. 
I, and I, I've told many people before, I took 24 pregnancy tests, Eloise. 24. Wow. Because you didn't believe it. 24. I said, I can tell you now, those companies were making some money. I should have gotten <laughs> stopped in pregnancy tests <laughs> because I took 24 You should have been those folks. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I should have been. I mean, it was, it was insane. And after a while, I was like, I started slowly, gradually accepting the fact that, okay, this is really happening. And I think more so when I felt her move for the first time, I was like, okay, I think you're all right. And I would hold on to that every day. And eventually it was patterns. Like I'd go to work and I, every morning she would move at the same time every morning. So I was like, okay, I know you're okay. So I think, um, or you find yourself like, let me drink some orange juice mm -hmm. just so I can feel you because you just want to make sure everything is fine. And, um, we took our maternity pictures. I think I was, what, seven months? And I didn't announce on so t until then that I was pregnant on social media. Seven months. I was almost due because I was just, like, so apprehensive about even mm -hmm. saying I was pregnant because you just, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Totally. And so I said, okay. When I did, I felt like a, a weight was, was lifted. I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm okay. Oh, and mm -hmm. and so what's been happening since then? Because you're mid-cycle at the moment, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So from that first cycle, we had four embryos, right? So yeah. we had Kennedy and I, my husband and I had decided once um, Kennedy got here, we said, okay, we're going to wait a year because I'll be 36 in June. So I said, we're going to wait a year um, and then we're going to try again because one, it's very good for your body to wait that time to, you know, get your body back to normal after a child because, you know, your body changes. Um, and we waited. So she turned one on the 20th of November of um, 2020. And we were like, OK, we're going to start fresh 2021. So January, we started having consultations, talked to the doctor, everything. and um we did a frozen embryo transfer in february so we did that and my first beta came back at 154.4 so we were thinking oh we're good this is it we you know went through our first cycle and i went back to my second beta and the numbers dropped to 106 mm -hmm. and so at that moment and what's crazy is i didn't cry at all i think it's because you go through so much. And um, as you've seen, Eloise, like I have a very strong faith in God. I, mm -hmm. I just, I believe in his timing. I believe that things happen in our lives for a reason and a purpose. And so when that happened, I didn't even, I didn't cry. I said, okay, you have a plan for us clearly. So I'm going to, we're going to ride this plan out and we're just going to stand with whatever plan you have God for us. And that's what we're going to do. So, um, I had an early miscarriage, biochemical pregnancy. And so after that, my doctor, she said, I'm going to ask you when you want to start. But I already know what you're going to say to me. And I said, I want to start now, like immediately. Like, I, I want to keep rolling. And she said, I knew you were going to say that. Mm -hmm. So as soon as that was over, like, we just were like, okay, we're going to start this next cycle. And that's what we've done. And so. Did you have to wait a month? to get your period yeah, back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we had to wait for my period to come, all of that. And then um, after that, she was like, okay, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. And so we just started everything, like just rolled into the next, the next thing. And um, now we're waiting prayerfully. Um, we had 15 eggs so, retrieved. So this is a fresh cycle that you're just doing now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you, you the... Sadly, the chemical pregnancy that you had um, from January was the re last remaining frozen embryo. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. So that was it. Like, I mean, I think for us, it was just, um, it's so easy to revert back and think about the failure. Yeah. Um, so for us, I think that those words that my husband told me from the first transfer fail really have stuck with me. And I'm thankful and grateful for him every day because I feel like if it wasn't for him telling me that, I would still, I would be devastated on every downside of this process because mm -hmm. it's, there's so many mm -hmm. things change daily um, and there's no guarantee. And so I think his words from that time stuck with me a hundred percent. 
So now um, with this cycle that we started, we had 15 eggs retrieved and um, 13 of them were um, able to be ICSID. And then we had nine fertilized and eight that we've sent for testing. That's amazing numbers. God is good. <laughs> so I mean, wow. So are you waiting to hear whether you can have a blastocyst transfer? So, yeah, so we're waiting to um, to make sure and see because we, we did PGS testing with our last batch as well. And so we are waiting for those results, which should be back prayerfully in the middle of next week to the end of next week. Okay. So we're waiting. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Wow. And will you have a choice about how many embryos are transferred? So with it is, it, I know it's different for every clinic. For our clinic, um, she, they transfer one because they don't want the risk of a high risk pregnancy because you know yeah. being pregnant with with multiples is high risk. Yeah. Um. There's a lot that comes with that, and so they usually just transfer one, which I'm completely fine with. And um, they at our clinic they don't allow you to choose your sex. So literally, it's like they transfer your embryo, which I'm cool with because it's kind of like um. It gives me the ability to kind of experience a pregnancy as a normal woman would. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can just say, I can be excited and surprised when they say, do you want to know sex? Like, I can be excited about the fact that I don't know. Um, and that's just me. I know everybody's different. Like, some people really like, look, I want to pick what I'm having if I've been through all this. And I get that, too. <laughs> but for me, it was just the idea of being able to experience the feeling of, anti- like, anticipation of what I'm having. Yeah, I'm, I'm wanting, you know, ultimately to have a healthy baby. That's the goal, Correct. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, so, wow, gosh. And um, what advice would you give for people who are watching in terms of starting the process, just from your own personal experience or managing your relationship whilst you're going through it or the dreaded two-week wait? So one, I would say, in regards to your relationship, lean on each other. And I say that because it's hard as a woman to describe what you're going through to your husband or your partner. I get it because um, taking those shots and the emotional roller coaster you're on, um, even the, the bits of pressure, because you're like, you feel like, okay, it's on me to get pregnant and all of these things. Um, communicate how you're feeling with your partner. Let um, your partner know what you're feeling. Don't be afraid to tell them and vice versa. Um, I think a lot of times in situations, um, it's easy to forget about the person that's not necessarily taking the needles and going through all of the the uh, pokes and prods of the machines and everything, um, but lean on each other. Take the time to listen to each other. If you need um, time to breathe, vocalize that. If you need a break, vocalize. Um, but it's important to communicate and to lean on each other in mm-hmm. terms of a relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll make you stronger if you do so. Um, I would say in regards to the two-week wait, um, literally, I know it's, it's easy to say, but try and keep your mind as busy as possible because you will drive yourself literally crazy. And I always tell um, followers and friends of mine that are going through it too, um, understand that you've done everything you can. There's nothing more that you can do because ultimately when they transfer that embryo, it's not up to you anymore. That's God's decision. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of those things where um, for me in the beginning, it was hard to let go because we're used to that control and the things that we do in our lives. Right. So I think the best thing that you can do is let go, leave your burdens to God and let go. Or as some people say, leave them at the altar and walk away. (laughs) because That's all you can do. Um, And once you do that, it's literally, you feel the weight disappear because there's not much that you can do. Because it's so hard, isn't it? Throughout the whole process, you yeah. kind of have your hand held, like metaphorically. Mm-hmm. But you do. You wait for the call and then you're told what to do and where to go and what you should be doing when. And you have all the support. And then suddenly yeah. 
that's it. You're left to your own devices and you're told to take a test or come in for bloods. And it's kind of like exactly. terrifying to be left like it that. Is. It is. And to sit there, like I, so many times I sit there and watch the videos of women and they're sitting in the waiting room and they have like the obligatory sitting in the lobby uh, videos and you see their little legs and, and feet just twitching from anxiety because it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. it you just sitting there waiting like, okay, I'm going to take this blood test. And then I have to go home and wait for this call that can come any time of the day. You have your phone by you all day long because you're like, oh, when they're going to call. And then if it's taking so long for them to call, you just all of a sudden assume bad news. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you just, to let go is probably the best advice I can give because to hold on to things that you can't control. And I mean, not only this, but just in life, it can consume you entirely and i find that when you do that it's like i don't know it feels like the devastation is so much more <laughs> when you don't let go yeah but when you do and you realize okay this isn't in my control it's not my plan um it helps it helps a lot and i think that's what honestly i have a, a lot of people have came to me and said how did you not cry when you miscarried and I was just like, because I did everything I could do. And it wasn't that I did anything wrong. It just wasn't the right timing. It's nothing I did. So I, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's like when you come to that, it's, it brings a peace that you that is just surpasses all understanding. Like, honestly. Um, totally. Yeah. yeah. I think that would be my advice. Really good advice. Thank you. And... Uh, wishing you all the best for this next stage of your cycle um yes. yeah we'll be following you and have everything crossed for you yes eloise i need all the prayers honey of course. <laughs> the support. Of course. and just um you know it's, it's it's a blessing what you're doing because you are bringing people who are in the community and also outside of the community into what a whole lot of women's and families' realities are. So I thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. Because a lot of people don't understand. They don't, you know, other than the things that we post or we put up, to see the different stories from different people who have different situations and come from different walks of life, mm -hmm. um, you're doing a good thing. Because, you know, it can be so lonely. And I, if, if anyone yes. watching doesn't know this, there's also an app. So you can go to the link in bio and it's anyone is welcome to come and join. Um, and it's for there to people, for people to get that support. So please do and check it out. But it's been so nice talking to you, Narissa. Thanks yeah, for have joined. Be. And yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be following everything that happens. So thinking. Yes. Of Maybe we'll do this again sometime. I enjoyed it. For sure. For sure. But keep doing what you're doing, sis. Keep doing. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.